Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Uh, it's 7 a.m. on the West Coast and 10 a.m. on the East Coast. This is Grace Lee, Chair of the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. Today is June 17th, 2022, and I'm pleased to call today's ACIP meeting to order. Uh, first, I will turn it over to Dr. Melinda Wharton to start with today's announcements. Uh, good morning, and thank you, Dr. Lee. Could I have the next slide, please? Uh, good morning, and welcome to the June 17th and 18th virtual ACIP meeting. Copies of the slides being presented at today's meeting are available or will be available soon on the ACIP website. Additionally, slides are available through a share file link for ACIP voting, liaison, and ex officio members. A few notes on meeting logistics for those who are listening in on the Zoom line. Please mute your lines at all time unless you're called on or until you're called on for discussion. When Dr. Lee opens the meeting for discussion, please use the virtual hand raising function in Zoom to let her know you want to speak. And during the discussion period, she'll take questions first from voting ACIP members and then from ex officio members and liaison representatives. Please disable your video. Uh, a profile picture is fine. Just Please don't uh, stream live video, um, although we'll ask ACIP voting members to turn on their video during the vote. Next slide, please. The Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices is at its heart a public body and engagement with the public and transparency in our processes are vital to the committee's work. For this meeting, we'll be holding one oral public comment period today at approximately 2.15 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. To create a fairer and more efficient process for requesting to make an oral comment, we ask that people interested in making an oral comment submit a request online in advance of the meeting. Priority is given to those advanced requests, and if more people request to speak than can be accommodated, we conduct a blind lottery to determine who the speakers will be. Speakers selected in the lottery for this meeting have been notified in advance of the meeting. Members of the public can also submit written public comments via regulations.gov using docket number ID DDC 2022-0079. Information on the written public comment process, including as well as information on how to make a comment can be found on the ACIP meeting website. Next slide, please. As noted in the ACIP policies and procedures manual, Members of the ACIP agree to forgo participation in certain activities related to vaccines during their tenure on the committee. For certain other interests that potentially enhance a member's expertise while serving on the committee, CDC has issued limited conflict of interest waivers. Members who conduct vaccine clinical trials or serve on data safety monitoring boards may present to the committee on matters related to those vaccines, but those members are pro prohibited from participating in a committee's votes on issues related to those vaccines. Regarding other vaccines of the concerned company, a member may participate in discussions with the provision that he or she abstains on all votes related to the vaccines of that company. At the beginning of each meeting, ACIP members state any conflicts of interest. Next slide, please. Uh, we are currently soliciting applications and nominations for candidates to fill upcoming vacancies on the committee. Detailed instructions for submission of names of potential candidates to serve as ACIP members are now available on the ACIP website. The deadline for applications for AC ACIP membership has been extended to August 15, 2022 for the four-year term beginning July 2023. We will be filling six positions at that time, including a consumer representative position. Next slide. And with that, I will uh, return the podium back over to Dr. Lee. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Wharton. And I do want to emphasize that uh, the ACIP nominations are open, and um, I would ask members of the audience uh, if they would be interested in uh, considering this position that's uh, really important service to our country. And I really appreciate those who are both willing to be considered and many of those who are on the committee today who have been willing to serve. Uh, so for the ACIP members, I will ask that you state your name, your affiliation, and whether you have any conflicts of interest for today's roll call. And today we will start with Dr. Talbot. Good morning. I am Kip Talbot. I'm an associate professor of medicine and health policy at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. I'm an adult infectious disease doctor and have no conflicts. Thank you. 
Thank you, Dr. Talbot. Uh, Dr. Sanchez. Hi, um, good morning. I'm Pablo Sanchez. I'm a professor of pediatrics at the Ohio State University College of Medicine and a neonatologist and pediatric infectious disease specialist at Nationwide Children's in Columbus. Thank you. And I have no conflict. Thank you, Dr. Sanchez. <laughs> uh, Dr. Paling. Good morning. This is Kathy Paling. I am a, a professor of pediatrics, epidemiology, and prevention at Wake Forest School of Medicine, Atrium Health, Wake Forest Baptist. And I have no conflicts. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Failing. Ms. McNally. Good morning, Veronica McNally with the Franny Strong Foundation based in Michigan, and I have no conflicts. Thank you, Ms. McNally. Dr. Long. Good morning, this is Sarah Long. I'm professor of pediatrics at Drexel University College of Medicine and a pediatric infectious disease doctor in Philadelphia, and I have no conflict of interest. Thank you, Dr. Long. Dr. Lair. My name is Dr. Jamie Lair. I'm the owner of a private family practice in Ithaca, New York, and I have no conflicts of interest. Thank you, Dr. Lair. Dr. Daly. Uh, good morning. Um, Matt Daly here. I'm a senior investigator at Kaiser Permanente, Colorado. I'm also an associate professor of pediatrics at the University of Colorado School of Medicine, and I have no conflicts of interest. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Daly. Dr. Chen. Good morning. Wilbur Chen, uh, Professor of Medicine at the University of Maryland School of Medicine's Center for Vaccine Development and Global Health. I have no conflicts. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Dr. Brooks. Oliver Brooks, Chief Medical Officer, Watts Healthcare Corporation in South Los Angeles, and I have no conflicts. Good morning. Good morning, and thank you, Dr. Brooks. Dr. Bell. Beth Bell, a clinical professor in the Department of Global Health in the School of Public Health at the University of Washington in Seattle, and I have no conflicts. Thank you, Dr. Bell. Ms. Bata. Good morning, Lynn Bata. I'm a public health nurse uh, working as a clinical consultant for the immunization program at the Minnesota Department of Health, and I have no conflicts. Thank you, Ms. Bata. Um, and this is Grace Lee. I'm a professor of pediatrics at Stanford University School of Medicine, associate chief medical officer for practice innovation at Stanford Children's Health, and I have no conflicts. So we do have quorum today and we can proceed. Uh, for our ex officio and liaison members, I will announce the organization name and please indicate um, if you are president and your first and last name. First, we'll begin with Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Dr. Romero. Thank you. Uh, sorry about that. I, Jose Romero, uh, uh, present. <laughs> Welcome, Dr. Romero. And we will introduce Dr. Romero in a little bit. Um, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Good morning. This is Mary Beth Hance for CMS. Thank you. Food and Drug Administration. Good morning, Doran Fink, present on behalf of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration Office of Vaccine. Thank you. Health Resources and Services Administration. This is Mayor Rubin from the Division of Injury Compensation Programs, HRSA. Thank you. Indian Health Service. Good morning. This is Dr. Matthew Clark representing the Indian Health Service. Thank you. National Institutes of Health. Good morning. John Bible from the National Institute of Allergy and Infections. Good morning. Office of Infectious Disease and HIV AIDS Policy. Good morning. David Kim with OIDP uh, National Vaccine Program. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I will run through our liaison representatives next. Um, I will skip a few that I know are not able to be on for roll call this morning. And at the end, I will ask if they have been able to join, if they would like to state their names. So uh, please don't worry if I skip over your organization briefly. Uh, American Academy of Family Physicians. Good morning, Pamela Rockwell, Professor of Family Medicine, University of Michigan, liaison for the American Academy of Family Physicians. Thank you. American Academy of Pediatrics. Connie Maldonado, Professor of Global Health and Infectious Diseases, Stanford University, and uh, representing the Committee on Infectious Diseases, American Academy of Pediatrics. 
Thank you. American Academy of Pediatrics Red Book. David Kimberlin, editor of the AAP Red Book. Thank you. American College Health Association. American College of Nurse Midwives. Carol Hayes, present. Thank you. American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. American Geriatric Society. Bench Mater for AGS. Thank you. America's Health Insurance Plans. Bob Gluckman here. Thank you. American Immunization Registry Association. Elizabeth Perella here. Thank you. American Medical Association. Sandra Freihofer, practicing general internist in Atlanta, adjunct associate professor of medicine at Emory, representing the American Medical Association. Oh, thank you, Dr. Freihofer. Uh, we'll go back to American Nurses Association. Uh, Chad Riddle, representing the ANA. Thank you. American Osteopathic Association. Good morning, Stan Garag, present. Good morning. American Pharmacists Association. Good morning, this is Michael Hogue, Dean and Professor at the Loma Linda University School of Pharmacy, Professor of Preventive Medicine at Loma Linda University School of Medicine, representing the American Pharmacists Association. Thank you. Association of Immunization Managers. Hi, this is Molly Howell, representing AIDS. Thank you. Association for Prevention, Teaching, and Research. Hi, Rick Zimmerman, University of Pittsburgh, present. Thank you. Association of State and Territorial Health Officials. Good morning, Dr. Lee. This is Nirok Shaw, the Director of the State of Maine CDC and the President of ASTA. Good morning. Biotechnology Innovation Organization. Council of State and Territorial Epidemiologists. Uh, good morning. This is Paul Cieslack, Oregon Health Authority, Medical Director for Communicable Disease and Immunizations, representing CSTD. Thank you. Canadian National Advisory Committee on Immunization. Good morning, Shelley Deeks, the chair of NACI. Good morning. Infectious Diseases Society of America. International Society for Travel Medicine. Good morning, Elizabeth Barnett, representing ISTM. Good morning. National Association of Pediatric Nurse Practitioners. Good morning, Patsy Stinchfield, representing NAPNAP. Thank you. National Foundation for Infectious Diseases. Good morning, this is Bill Schaffner, Medical Director of the NFID. Good morning, thank you. National Medical Association. Good morning, this is Dial Hewlett, representing the NMA. Thank you. Pediatric Infectious Diseases Society. Good morning, this is Mark Sawyer. I'm substituting for Sean O'Leary and representing PIDS. Thank you. Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America. Good morning, Corey Robertson, present. Thank you. Society for Adolescent Health and Medicine. Society for Healthcare Epidemiology of America. Good morning, this is Marcy Dries, Chief Infection Prevention Officer at Christiana Care, representing Shea. Thank you, Dr. Dries. Um, and with that, I will ask if there are any um, liaison members who've been able to join after a roll call and would like to announce themselves. Dr. Lee, it's uh, Jason Goldman, Affiliate Associate Professor at the Florida Atlantic University, General Internal Medicine, Carl Springs, Florida, representing the American College of Physicians. Pleasure to be here. Thank you, Dr. Goldman. Anyone else? Uh, good morning, Dr. Lee. This is Matt Zahn. I'm on representing Nature. Oh, thank you, Dr. Zahn. Any additional uh, liaison members would like to announce themselves? All right, thank you everyone. Um, now, I am very excited to take a pause and introduce and welcome back um, our colleague, Dr. Jose Romero, who has just started in his role as the director of the National Center for Immunization and Respiratory Diseases for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Um, as many of you remember, prior to becoming center director, he served as the Arkansas Secretary of Health and director of the Arkansas Department of Health. He led his state's response to the COVID-19 pandemic from 2020 to 2022. And before that, he was the chief medical officer for the Arkansas Department of Health and director of PSID at the University of Arkansas for Medical Science. 
Um, importantly, many of you remember that Dr. Romero served as our chair, so chair of the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, and he saw us through the start of the COVID-19 pandemic until October 2021 when his term ended. Um, we are so grateful that he's now willing to serve our country yet again as director of NCIRD, which is a critically important role for our country and particularly during this pandemic and many other infectious diseases um, that seem to be arising in, the, in our country. Uh, we are thrilled that you're here today and we wanted to give you a moment to say a few words, Dr. Romero. Thank you, Dr. Lee. And with your permission, I'll uh, put myself on video um, as, I, as I address the, uh, the committee. You. So um, good morning to you all. Um, uh, most of you I have met, and I'm sorry I have not met um, all of you uh, because of the pandemic. I hope that I can do so in the, in the future. Um, I'm pleased to be joining you all um, as the uh, Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices convenes today and tomorrow to consider expanding COVID-19 vaccines to children ages six months up to five years. I want to thank the ACIP voting members, its liaisons, the ex officio members and the CDC members for the countless numbers of hours you have all dedicated to questions of COVID-19 vaccine, COVID vaccines, as well as non-COVID vaccines uh, over the last two years. Uh, you have been asked to give so much of yourselves, your time, time away from your family, your, your own uh, uh, weekends and holidays during this unprecedented period in our history. And it'd be remiss if I didn't uh, thank uh, Dr. Posner, uh, for uh, sitting uh, in this position uh, uh, prior to my arrival. Um, he's done a heroic effort um, in maintaining uh, our uh, communications with you all. I also uh, would like to thank everyone at the CDC and all our public health partners who have worked hard to, ready, to get ready <clears throat> the vaccines uh, to, that will be for children and for families should the results of your deliberations be favorable for their use. Lastly, I would like to convey my gratitude to the public who have come to speak with the ACIP during our public comment sessions. It is important that we hear all points of view. Um, it was less than a year ago that I sat where many of you are uh, now as chair of uh, this uh, ACIP committee. Many things have changed since, that, since then in some ways uh, that we did not expect. I certainly did not anticipate that I would return to speak to the ACIP as the newly appointed director of the centers for our national, the CDC's uh, National Center for Immunization and Respiratory uh, Diseases, NCIRD. I'm humbled and grateful to be here uh, with all of you now, and I'm excited uh, for the progress that we have made and the promise of the availability of additional vaccines for everyone to protect themselves and their families from the most serious and deadly consequences of SARS-CoV-2 infection. I very much look forward to continuing uh, collaboration with all of you um, on the work to fight uh, SARS-CoV-2 um, pandemic, along with our intensified efforts to refocus attention on immunization ac across the lifespan, with things like catching up on gaps in childhood immunization coverage, addressing adult immunization inequities, and preparing for the upcoming influenza season. Thank you all for all you have done, all you will do in the future, and all you are doing now. I look forward to seeing many of you at the next uh, next Thursday, when I am able to join you uh, for the regularly scheduled ACIP next meeting. Uh, back to you, Dr. Lee, and thank you for this opportunity to address the committee, its members, liaison, uh, and the public. Thank you so much, Dr. Romero, and we are so happy to have you back. <laughs> um, next, I'll ask Dr. Melinda Wharton to say a few words to set the stage for today. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lee. Um, First, I'd like to invite our colleagues from FDA to provide an update on recent regulatory action by the Food and Drug Administration. Uh, Dr. Marks or Dr. Fink? Uh, Dr. I, Fink. Yeah, hi, it's, uh, it's Dr. Fink. Uh, Dr. Marks is otherwise occupied uh, this morning, but I will, I will give my usual update. Uh, and so I think as, as many of you um, are aware, uh, a short time ago, uh, earlier this morning, FDA uh, uh, took action to authorize uh, the Moderna COVID-19 vaccine for use in uh, pediatric uh, age groups six months through 17 years, and also took action to authorize the Pfizer uh, COVID-19 uh, vaccine for use in uh, the pediatric age group of six months 
through uh, four years. Uh, both of these uh, actions followed our uh, BRPAC, uh, Vaccines and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee uh, meetings earlier this week. The uh, primary uh, basis of um, uh, effectiveness uh, for both of these vaccines in the age groups for which they've just been authorized uh, was uh, an immunobridging analysis, or rather immunobridging analyses, um, uh, comparing neutralizing antibody responses uh, among uh, children uh, enrolled in uh, clinical trials to those in uh, individuals in uh, adult or, or older adolescent age groups uh, for whom uh, the vaccines had been demonstrated uh, to, to be effective in uh, efficacy trials. Uh, additionally, uh, we had uh, other supportive information on effectiveness uh, that added to the immunobridging assessment. The FDA assessment of, uh, of safety data uh, was that the uh, safety profile of both of these vaccines uh, in pediatric age uh, individuals uh, uh, from uh, a clinical trial experience uh, as well as uh, available safety information from post-authorization use in older individuals supported a determination of favorable benefit risk, uh, and therefore FDA determined that the known and potential benefits of these vaccines when used uh, in individuals uh, in the age ranges for, for whom they are authorized um, outweigh the known and potential risks, and therefore the vaccines are now uh, available uh, in all age groups from six months uh, upwards uh, under emergency use uh, authorization. Uh, I do want to uh, 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 reiterate uh, uh, a sentiment that was conveyed at, at, the, at the VRPAC meetings earlier this week, uh, that authorization of, of these vaccines down to, to age six months uh, represents an important step uh, in our uh, efforts uh, to, to combat the, the COVID-19 pandemic, and it provides options uh, to parents uh, and caregivers uh, of children uh, who wish uh, to use the vaccines uh, uh, to uh, improve their protection against uh, COVID-19 and its, its serious outcomes. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you, Dr. Wortley. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so. The Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices is meeting today to begin discussions on the use of COVID-19 vaccines in younger children. We will be discussing Moderna's COVID-19 vaccine as a two-dose series for children six months to five years of age, and Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine as a three-dose series for children six months to four years of age, and plan to ask for a committee vote tomorrow on these two questions. We'll be discussing use of the Moderna vaccine in older children, those 6 to 17 years of age, at our regularly scheduled meeting next week on June 23rd. With that, I'll turn the meeting back over to Dr. Lee. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fink and Dr. Wharton. Um, we will move on to our first session of the morning. Uh, Dr. Matt Daly, Chair of the COVID-19 Vaccines Workgroup, will provide an introduction and an overview of today's session. So, Dr. Daly, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee. Um, I'm speaking today on behalf of the ACIP COVID-19 Vaccines Workgroup. Next slide, please. Um, this slide illustrates trends in the number of COVID-19 cases in the United States across all age groups. Um, and since the start of the pandemic, there have been over 85 million reported cases and currently in the country, we're averaging more than 103,000 reported cases per day. Next slide, please. And then uh, illustrated on this slide are the number of COVID-19 deaths in the United States across all ages. And since the start of the pandemic, more than 1 million individuals have died from COVID-19. And currently, almost 300 people are dying each day from COVID-19 in the country. Next slide, please. Um, to orient you to the figure on the right, um, age in years is on the x-axis and COVID-19 deaths per 100,000 population is on the y-axis. And as you can see, children at every age have died from COVID-19. 
And to put these deaths in a broader context, COVID-19 is the leading cause of death among infectious diseases for people aged zero to 19 years. And COVID-19 is the seventh most common of all causes of death for people ages zero to 19 years. And among people ages one to four years of age, COVID-19 is the fifth most common of all causes of death. Next slide, please. Um, this figure shows rates of COVID-19 deaths by vaccination status among all people um, five years of age and older. And the rate among unvaccinated is the black line. And the rate among vaccinated with at least a primary series is the blue line. And through March of 2022, unvaccinated people five years of age and older had 10 times the risk of dying from COVID-19 compared to those vaccinated with at least the primary series. And phrased another way, these data and this figure provide real world evidence that most deaths from COVID-19 are preventable through vaccination. Next slide, please. So we've included this slide to provide some additional context for today's discussion. Um, each of the diseases listed are vaccine preventable. And please note that the age groups may differ depending on the vaccine. Um, I draw your attention to the last row in this table, which shows the average number of deaths per year in the time prior to when these vaccines were routinely recommended for use. And COVID-19 has caused more deaths than all of these other diseases. And today we're here to meet about prevention of COVID-19. And with the exception of COVID-19, for all the diseases in this table, as a nation, we've achieved relatively high vaccination coverage. And this means that parents, and providers have accepted that the benefits strongly outweigh the risks and that it is worth vaccinating, even though the number of deaths are relatively rare because these deaths are preventable through vaccination. Next slide, please. On this slide and the next, we wanted to describe influenza vaccination and disease. And we do so while recognizing that there are some differences between seasonal influenza and pandemic COVID-19, but we thought this might provide some additional context for the discussion today. So over the last decade, between 63% and 75% of parents of children six months through four years of age chose to vaccinate their children against influenza. Next slide, please. And so starting on the right of this slide, um, influenza causes substantial disease burden in young children every year. And vaccine efficacy is variable, ranging from 19% to um, 60% over the past decade, with some of this variability in vaccine efficacy due to changes in the circulating influenza strains. And despite this variable vaccine efficacy, most parents vaccinate and a substantial amount of disease is averted. So now I'll direct you to the left side. Um, in this age range, approximately 4.3 to 20.1 million illnesses have been prevented through vaccination over the past decade through vaccination. Um, so 2.9 to 15.5 million uh, healthcare visits have been prevented. Between 32,000 and 164,000 hospitalizations have been prevented. And between 130 and 2,350 deaths have been prevented through vaccination in children six months through four years of age. Next slide, please. Um, so um, currently there's no COVID-19 vaccine that is authorized for use and recommended for use under age five, although we heard from Dr. Fink that now vaccines are authorized in this age group. And, uh, and as Dr. Fink has said, now there is another vaccine that's uh, authorized and we'll discuss that um, next week as well. Next slide, please. So um, the FDA, FDA update um, Dr. Fink provided and just to um, provide a little bit of additional context on June 14th, VRPAC met to review the request for an emergency use authorization for Moderna in children and adolescents six through 17 years of age. We'll discuss that next week. On June 15th, VRPAC met and reviewed a request for an emergency use authorization for the mater Moderna vaccine in children six months through five years of age and the Pfizer vaccine for use in children six months through four years of age. And those were authorized this morning. And that's the topic of discussion today and tomorrow. Next slide, please. 
So um, I just want to highlight um, COVID-19 vaccine workgroup activities in the last um, three to four weeks. So the work group reviewed and discussed the vaccine safety, immunogenicity, and efficacy data, including both the immunobridging and laboratory confirmed direct efficacy for Moderna's vaccine from six months through five years of age and from six to 17 years of age. We also, in the last several weeks, reviewed vaccine safety, immunogenicity, and efficacy data, again, including both immunobridging and laboratory confirmed efficacy for the Pfizer vaccine for use in children and at children uh, six months to four years of age. In addition, we reviewed COVID-19 epidemiology and outcomes for children six months or five years of age. We also reviewed the post-authorization vaccine effectiveness for COVID-19 vaccines in children and adolescents age five through 17 years. And then we reviewed the grading of recommendations, assessment and evaluation or grade and the evidence to recommendations framework for both vaccines for use in children six months through five years of age. Next slide, please. So here is the agenda for today. Um, first, we're going to hear from Dr. Fleming Dutra from the CDC, who's going to review epidemiology of COVID-19 in young children. Then we'll hear from Dr. Link Gellis from the CDC, who's going to review COVID-19 vaccine effectiveness in children and adolescents. Following that, we'll have a break. Following the break, we'll hear from Dr. Doss from Moderna, who will pre present safety and immunogenicity of Moderna's two-dose primary series in children ages six months through five years of age. Following this, we'll hear from Dr. Gruber from Pfizer, who will review safety and immunogenicity of BNT162B2 as a three-dose primary series in children six months through four years of age. Following this, we'll hear from Dr. Oliver from the CDC, who will review mRNA COVID-19 vaccines in young children. She will provide a summary as well as work group interpretation. After Dr. Oliver's presentation, we will hear public comment and then close for the day. Next slide, please. Um, so I wanna sincerely thank all of the uh, work group members for the ACIP COVID-19 vaccines work group, including ACIP members, ex officio and government members, liaisons, consultants, and CDC leads, Dr. Sarah Oliver and Dr. Evelyn Twentyman. Uh, next slide, please. I'd also like to thank all of the CDC participants who made all of this work possible. Next slide, please. Looks like um, that, that's my last slide. So back to you, Dr. Lee, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Daly. And I just want to confirm that, um, I see, okay. Um, uh, just a brief announcement that typically uh, the slides will get posted in addition on the ACIP website uh, simultaneously uh, with the presentations. And I believe there's a request to make sure that those are posted for the public. We will work on that um, at the same time. Thank you, Dr. Daly, uh, for that introduction and for that um, updated information. It's really helpful to place this in context. Um, next, we would like to introduce Dr. Catherine Fleming Dutra, uh, who will present on the updated epidemiology of COVID-19 in young children. Good morning. Can you can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thanks. Next slide. So here's an overview of what I'll cover today. Next slide. Um, of course, we're talking um, today about the epidemiology of COVID-19 in children ages six months through four years. But for purposes of comparison, I will show I will also show data from children ages five through 11 years and adolescents 12 through 17 years who have already been eligible for COVID-19 vaccination for some time. Next slide. So let's start with COVID-19 incidence and burden. Next slide. So here we see the trends in the number of COVID-19 cases in the U.S. among persons of all ages, and you just saw this, um, this graph. As of June 14th, um, there were more than 85 million total recorded cases of COVID-19 in the U.S. Next. And the Omicron surge started in December 2021 and led to a large spike in COVID-19 cases through the winter of 2022. Next. And as of June 14th, as we just heard, the seven-day moving average was more than 100,000 cases um, per day. Next slide. So now focusing on the pediatric population, here we see the weekly rate of COVID-19 cases per 100,000 population by age group. 
COVID-19 case rates were much higher during the Omicron surge compared to any previous time during the pandemic, with the highest rates seen in adolescents 12 through 17 years, shown in dark blue, then older children 5 through 11 years, shown in light blue, and followed by infants less than one, shown in gray, and children 1 through 4 years, shown in red. Next slide. Total during the pandemic, over 570,000 COVID-19 cases have occurred in infants aged less than one year, and over 1.9 million cases have occurred in children ages one through four years. Next. But not all COVID-19 cases are captured using traditional disease surveillance methods, because some cases are asymptomatic, not diagnosed, or not reported. Tracking the proportion of the population with SARS-CoV-2 antibodies or the seroprevalence can improve understanding of population-level incidence of COVID-19. This figure shows the seroprevalence of infection-induced SARS-CoV-2 antibodies from the National Commercial Lab Seroprevalence Study from September 2021 through April 2022 by age groups. Seroprevalence in all age groups increased substantially during the Omicron surge. And as you can see, children ages six months through four years in red had a larger increase in seroprevalence since December 2021 than the other two age groups. The study is now continuing with two month data collection periods, and the rate of rise in seroprevalence was less steep between February 2022 than the combined March April time point, when the seroprevalence was estimated at 71% among children ages six months through 40 years. Next. Moving on to healthcare associated um, with COVID 19, starting with emergency department or ED visits. Next. Here is the weekly percent of ED visits with a COVID-19 diagnosis among all ED visits for children ages 1 through 17 years from CDC's National Syndromic Surveillance Program through May 2022. The dashed line marks December 19, 2021, the first date when more than 50% of nationally sequenced SARS-CoV-2 specimens were the Omicron variant, which was followed by a surge in COVID-19 ED visits among children ages 1 through 4 years, 5 through 11, and adolescents 12 through 17. Although a few slides ago we saw that the rate of COVID-19 cases was lower among children ages 1 through 4 versus older children and adolescents, here you can see um, during the Omicron surge, here you can see that the trends of COVID-19 ED visits during the Omicron surge were very similar among all three age groups. Next slide. Moving on to COVID-19 associated hospitalizations, including burden and severity. Next. Here we see COVID-19 associated hospitalizations over 100,000 population from CDC's covid net surveillance system. Hospitalization rates also increased during the Omicron surge to the highest rates yet seen during the pandemic. During 2022, among these age groups, hospitalization rates were highest among children ages six months through four years, shown in red, followed by adolescents 12 through 17 in dark blue and children five through 11 in light blue. Next slide. To further illustrate this point, we can look at the cumulative COVID-19 associated hospitalization rate. You can see that during the Omicron surge among children six months through four years, the slope of the cumulative hospitalization rate was steeper than among older children and adolescents. And by March 2022, the cumulative hospitalization rate was higher among children six months through four years who were not eligible for vaccination during this time than among adolescents who were. Next slide. And we know that vaccination prevents hospitalization. Here are the monthly COVID-19 associated hospitalization rates by vaccination status. Adolescents 12 through 17 years in dark blue who were vaccinated with at least a primary series shown by the solid line had lower hospitalization rates than those who were unvaccinated in the dashed line. Although children ages 5 through 11 years in light blue have lower hospitalization rates overall than adolescents, the same pattern can be seen after they became eligible for vaccination in late 2021. It's important to note that the benefits of vaccination are more pronounced when the disease burden is high. And we can predict that with future COVID-19 surges, the unvaccinated will continue to bear the burden of disease. Next slide. So why are these children being hospitalized? The COVID net surveillance platform captures hospitalized persons with a positive SARS-CoV-2 test within 14 days of or during hospital admission. And here we see the proportion of children ages six months through four years in COVID net who were primarily admitted for COVID-19 during the Omicron period and the pre-Omicron period. Primarily admitted for COVID-19 was defined based on the reason for admission field on the case report form. So if a chief 
If the chief complaint were the history of present illness in the medical chart documented fever or respiratory illness, COVID-19-like illness, or suspicion for COVID-19, then that case was categorized as having COVID-19 as the primary reason for admission. Examples of non-COVID-19 reasons for admission are trauma or inpatient surgery. So in both the Omicron and pre-Omicron periods, you can see that the vast majority, 86 to 87 percent of children ages six months through four years with COVID-19 associated hospitalizations in covid net were primarily admitted for COVID-19. Next slide. So who's getting hospitalized for COVID-19? This figure shows the percent of children ages six months through four years with COVID-19 associated hospitalization with at least one underlying health condition from two CDC surveillance platforms, COVID-Net, and the new vaccine surveillance network. In both surveillance systems, just under half of children ages six months through four years with COVID-19 associated hospitalization have one or more underlying health condition. Conversely, this means that over half of children ages six months through four years had no underlying health condition. Next slide. So now let's look at markers of severity among COVID-19 associated hospitalization by age group and COVID net, focusing on December 19th, 2021 through March 31st, 2022, or the Omicron period. Children ages six months through four years, again shown in red, were more often admitted to the intensive care unit or ICU than older children and adolescents. During this time, almost 24% of children ages six months through four years were admitted to the ICU. Children ages six months through four years were more often placed on high flow nasal cannula than older children and adolescents. And over 6% of children ages six months through four years were placed on mechanical ventilation versus about 5% of children five through 11 years and 4.5% of adolescents. These data indicate that during Omicron predominance, COVID-19 associated hospitalization severity among children six months through four years appeared to be as high or higher than that in older children and in adolescents. Next slide. Now that we've examined the burden and severity of COVID-19 associated hospitalization um, among pediatric age groups, let's pivot and compare COVID-19 hospitalization in children to other key pediatric infectious diseases. Next slide. And we'll start by comparing hospitalizations for influenza and COVID-19. The figure is from a recent paper which used data from COVIDnet and FluServeNet, which conducts surveillance for influenza-associated hospitalizations from October 1st to April 30th each year, the typical U.S. influenza season. The solid black line is the COVID-19-associated hospitalization rate during October 2020 through September 2021, and the solid red line is the preliminary COVID-19 associated hospitalization rate during October 21 through April 22. Influenza associated hospitalization rates from 2017 through 2022 are shown by flu season in gray and in the dashed red line for the preliminary data from the most recent flu season. Next. Among children six months through four years, COVID-19 hospitalization rates from October 2020 through September 2021 were lower than influenza hospitalization rates during pre-pandemic influenza season. However, in this age group, the preliminary COVID-19 hospitalization rates during October 2021 to April 2022, which includes the Omicron surge, were as high or higher than influenza hospitalization rates for all influenza seasons um, shown here. And as we all know, influenza vaccination is recommended every flu season for all children six months of age and older. COVID-19 associated hospitalization burden among children six months through four years was similar to or exceeded the pre-vaccine era burden of other now vaccine preventable diseases, including hepatitis A, varicella, and vaccine type invasive pneumococcal disease. Next slide. And tragically, COVID-19 is a leading cause of mortality in children. Next slide. This figure shows the number of COVID-19 deaths in children by age through May 11, 2022. And sadly, among children ages six months through four years, there have been 202 COVID-19 related deaths, accounting for 1.7% of all deaths in this age group. Next slide. And COVID-19 was a leading cause of death among children and adolescents during the pandemic. Previously, we've shown data to ACIP that during 2020, COVID-19 was the 11th cause of death among children ages 5 through 11 years. But this has changed through the course of the pandemic. 
And looking at data through April 2022, COVID-19 now ranks as the fourth and fifth causes of death among children zero through 19 years of age. Next slide. COVID-19 associated deaths among children ages six months through four years, as we've already heard today, exceed the pre-vaccine era burden of other now vaccine preventable diseases shown here. Multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children or MISD is another important complication of COVID-19 in children. Next slide. MISD is a severe illness in persons ages zero through 20 years characterized by fever, multi-system organ involvement, inflammation, and SARS-CoV-2 um, SARS infection with no alternative plausible, um, plausible diagnosis. It occurs two to six weeks after acute infection, and 60 to 70% of patients are admitted to intensive care, and one to 2% die. Next slide. Here are the daily MISD and COVID-19 cases reported to CDC. In total, during the pandemic, more than 8,500 MISD cases and 69 deaths have occurred. Reports of MISD shown by the blue line typically follow increases in COVID-19 cases, which are shown by the dashed black line. However, following the Omicron surge, reports of MISD did not increase to the same level as occurred following prior waves of COVID-19 cases. Next slide. Now we can look at the weekly MISD case counts by age group through May 31st. Children six months through four years are shown in dark blue, five through 11 in orange, and adolescents 12 through 17 in the middle shade gray blue. Next. And during the pandemic, a total of 1,990 cases of MISD and nine deaths from MISD have occurred among children ages six months through four years. Next slide. And unfortunately, throughout the pandemic, MISD has disproportionately affected black children which is shown here with the percent of MISD patients ages six months through 17 years during the pandemic by race and ethnicity and age group. Next. So let's talk about post-COVID conditions. Next. Post-COVID conditions include a range of new returning or ongoing health problems occurring four or more weeks after acute SARS-CoV-2 infection, and they occur both in adults and children. A large study in Denmark indicated that children ages zero through five years with SARS-CoV-2 infection are more likely than controls who didn't had uh, without known who had no known SARS-CoV-2 infection to experience fatigue, loss of taste, and loss of smell lasting more than four weeks after acute infection. Next slide. However, evidence regarding the prevalence and spectrum of post-COVID conditions among children, especially young children, is limited by the inability of younger children to verbalize symptoms few studies that include children, and among the studies that do, a lack of appropriate control groups, and because symptoms frequently occur in children without known SARS-CoV-2 infection, which makes it difficult to determine which symptoms are attributable to post-COVID conditions. Next slide. And there are other impacts of the pandemic on children and families. Next. And child care has been particularly challenging for families during the pandemic. This Kaiser Family Foundation graph shows the percent of parents during July and August 2021 who said that in the past year, they or another adult in their household left a job or changed work schedules to take care of their children. Next. And these data highlight the disparities of this impact. Parents of children under the age of five, younger parents, Black and Hispanic parents, and parents with lower household incomes, incomes were more likely to report that their household had a job disruption due to childcare needs. And job disruptions have negative impacts on both parents and children. Next. And other impacts of the pandemic on children include worsening of mental or emotional health, widening of existing education gaps, decreased physical activity and increased body mass index, decreased healthcare utilization and routine immunization, and increase in child adverse childhood experiences. Next. So in conclusion, Next, to date, COVID-19 has caused more than 570,000 cases among infants less than one year and more than 1.9 million cases among children ages one through four years. The Omicron surge in the United States has led to the highest numbers of COVID-19 cases, emergency department visits, and hospitalization rates among this age group yet seen during the pandemic. Next. Children ages six months through four years are at risk of severe illness from COVID-19. 
More than half of hospitalized children ages six months through four years had no underlying condition. During Omicron predominance, COVID-19 associated hospitalizations among children ages six months through four years had similar or increased severity compared to older children and adolescents. And the burden of COVID-19 hospitalization is similar to or exceeds that of other pediatric vaccine preventable diseases. And finally, the COVID-19 pandemic continues to have significant impact on families and increases disparities. Next. Presentation is the work of many people that I would like to thank. And next. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for that excellent presentation. This presentation is now open for questions. Ms. Bata? Yes, um, and, and thank you, uh, Dr. Fleming uh, Dutra. Just a clarification um, about the, the 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 data related to uh, hospitalization during Omicron um, and and death. We we saw that rise. Was that um, a proportional rise compared to the other? Um, variants in the original Wuhan strain, or um, was there something special about the Omicron variant that um, created more hospitalization? Um, just to clarify, are you referring to just the, the overall rates of hospitalization, the rise in overall rates of hospitalization? Yes. Um, I think that's... Um, it's an important and interesting question, and I'll, I'll start, and if there's others on the line who want to weigh in. I think um, we see very clearly with the epidemiology throughout the pandemic, or you know, from um, the case count, the ED visits, and the hospitalization rates, that we saw a tremendous surge in um, all of those um, COVID-19 cases, COVID-19 ED visits, and hospitalizations um, during the Omicron surge. So it certainly reflects the overall epidemiology, the pandemic, that there was lots of um, transmission and infections occurring um, in the population. I think um, regarding um, differences um, with um, the variant itself, certainly that is at play with, um, yes, sir. Oh, I think there's others raising their hands for question. Certainly that's at play with the, um, the, how much transmission and infection there was occurring in the country. Um, I don't know if Dr. Havers is on the line, if she wants to speak a little bit more uh, uh, if she wants to add anything else to, to that answer or others. Yeah, this, this is Fiona Havers. Can you hear me? You can. Thank you. Um, yeah, no, I think during Omicron, I, I think there was a very real increase, a massive surge, and particularly in young children in terms of severe illness. Probably proportionally, it may have been less severe in general in the population overall, but there was so much community transmission going on at the time that if, you know, a large number of children are being infected, even if most of them don't end up in the hospital. In terms of absolute numbers, we did see um, a very severe impact on very young children, and it was it was very striking during the Omicron surge. So um, I don't know if that directly answers the question, but I think we, it was a very real increase in that time, particularly among young children. It was very disproportionate among young children, as as Dr. Fleming Dutra showed. Thank you. Um, Dr. Paling. Hi, thank you very much for a fabulous presentation. I would like to highlight a few things to verify that I'm interpreting information correctly and then ask a question. So as I'm looking at this data, um, is, I understand that for um, each age group of children, COVID-19 is either the fourth or fifth leading cause of death, saying that this is not a minor illness in children, and that um, of the children that get hospitalized, about a quarter will go into the ICU, further verifying it, and humbling enough, um, half of the children that get hospitalized um, do not have un underlying conditions, so it's not that easy to predict, and that 86, 87% of all hospitalizations are clearly COVID-related. So um, I very much appreciate this data. I also understood that um, it looks like on the graphs that um, COVID-19 uh, ED visits 
in the more recent wave are similar or maybe slightly higher than other age groups in children, and that they're clearly higher for COVID hospitalizations and other age groups. One of the things that, um, now it's a question. So in MISC, we saw that the um, blacks were most significantly in, um, impacted by um, the MISC. And so I wanted to ask about, do we have any data about race and ethnicity differences among uh, hospitalizations or ED visits or deaths by race and ethnicity. Thank you. Um, thank you for that question. And, and just to, um, to confirm that your interpretation of those highlights um, was correct. Um, regarding information about race and ethnicity um, for hospitalizations, we do have that. And I may just um, see if Dr. Havers um, would like to weigh in on, on that question as well, um, because it comes, much of the data comes from COVID net. Yeah, thank you. We do see large disparities in the um, in the COVID net data by race and ethnicity. I think um, a large number of, of children are disproportionately um, non-Hispanic, Black, Hispanic, and American Indian and Alaska Native. Um, this has been consistent throughout the pandemic, and it does reflect the disparities we've seen in all age groups, but it is particularly pointed in um, the pediatric age group as well as adults. But, but there are dis disparities on that. And there is um, data on that publicly available on on COVID uh, on the COVID data tracker as well. Thank you, Dr. Lair. Thank you for your presentation. Could you go to slide 30 for me? Um, I wanted to sort of check my math and make sure I'm doing something correctly. Um, if I'm looking at this correctly, for the whole pandemic, we have 8,500 MISC cases. However, when I did the math for the number of COVID cases for children, it was about 15 million. And so when I'm doing it, it looks like the order of magnitude is one every 2,000 cases of COVID, you have an MISC case. Um, and I just want to make sure that that's accurate from the data that I'm seeing, and then I'll explain why. Is Dr. Zambrano on the line? We have our MISC unit on the line. Hi, hi yes, this is Dr. Zambrano. Um, can you hear me? Yes, you can. Okay, great. Yeah, so there are, are a few data sources that have actually inter interrogated this question. And one thing that's important to note is that even among co most MISC cases actually are derived from symptomatic or, or subclinical um, SARS-CoV-2 infections. And so sometimes looking at it, um, at the COVID-19 cases as a denominator um, may actually wind up overestimating your incidence. Um, and so we do have some estimates based off of some of our burden and severity models that really have pinned uh, true incidence between about like say 3,000 and 4,000 uh, MISC cases for every SARS-CoV-2 infection, including asymptomatic infection. Um, and so we are, and we are actually in the process of updating that data right now, but um, I'd also be happy to share some some resources that provide uh, that estimate as well. The reason I'm asking is because I have regular questions from parents about what's the risk of my child getting MISC, and they're talking whether it's 1% or 5% or 10%. And my perspective here from this data is suggesting that it's very low, that it's one in 2,000 um, of COVID cases that we know, and that's not even including cases that we don't know. So that's just interesting information for me. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Daly? Yeah, um, thanks so much. First, a comment and then a question. The comment is just, um, you know, that I so appreciate your ability to put this in some context and framing. And I'm thinking about it for us as members, but also for parents because parents have long heard the message that, you know, COVID is less severe than in, in young kids than in, than in older adults. But I, I feel like your, your, your presentation did such a wonderful job of putting it in context of some other things that parents may be aware of, other diseases, other causes of death. So I, I, I feel like um, it's, it's just so important to put it in context in those terms that parents then can sort of use to help with their decision-making. Cause they're asking, is this vaccine needed? And I feel like your talk goes a long way to make it the argument that it is. And then my question is, um, 
is it true that for any given hospitalization, that hospital that hospitalization may be as severe or more severe for kids under five as for other kids of older ages? Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, thank you for that um, comment and the question. So um, if I can have slide 19 again, and I will also ask Dr. Havers to, to weigh in if she wants to add to this. These data are from the Omicron period and we um, and uh, COVID-Net um, uh, did look at uh, markers of severity in that time frame. So ICU, high flow nasal cannula, BiPAP or CPAP use of mechanical ventilation. And these data indicate that at least during this Omicron predominant period from December to March, that it appears that children six months to four years had, um, you know, were as likely or, or more likely really to, to have these markers of severity. That being said, this is limited to the Omicron period. And this is a time frame in which children ages five through 11 and adolescents 12 through 17 were already eligible for vaccination. Um, Dr. Havers, do you want to add, add to that? Sure, thank you for that um, question. I think we are seeing that um, conditional on hospitalization, a, a high proportion of kids of all ages have severe outcomes as measured by um, ICU admission um, and the use of mechanical ventilation or higher levels of oxygen. Um, but as you can see that, you know, among, and this is including during the Omicron period, and we published a number of reports about this. Um, so I think it's overall, I think um, it's hard to compare severity across age groups, but I do think that as you can see from these data that children under, under five years um, have, have a, like a high level of fairly severe outcomes, but thank you. Yeah, I mean, just just to, yeah, just to, this is Matt Daly again. Just to add to that, I mean, I think as a as a clinician, um, you know, being moved to the ICU, we always feel like is a is a, a sentinel event because that 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 acknowledges that that this illness is life threatening, and that's why somebody's being moved to the ICU. So that that seems like a a, a reasonable proxy for severity of illness, and this is a high proportion. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Long. Yes, um, I wonder if we could see this slide about uh, the morbidity and mortality averted by vaccination in the older age groups that you showed us. And I, I'm so grateful for your putting this together because these very clear data should just decimate the myth that this infection is not life-threatening in this age group. Um, so uh, thank you for that. And I don't want to take anything away from that, but my question is going to be, what uh, might we expect for this vaccination to do to outpatient uh, and ED visits? So it's that slide that you showed us about um, things averted in the older age groups. Um, so I believe you may be either talking about slide 23, which is regarding hospitalization, or slide 27 regarding uh, um, deaths. Maybe we'll start. May I have slide 23? Well, my question really was on those slides. I was so impressed and wanting to get very clear the deaths and hospitalization. I missed. Maybe you didn't show us any uh, prevention of outpatient visits or ED visits in the older age group for which we have a lot of data post um, vaccination authorization and recommendations. Maybe you didn't show us, that's my question. I, um, I did not have a similar slide um, for ED visits um, or, or cases. Um, I, I believe that next we'll be hearing um, a talk from Dr. Link Ellis on vaccine effectiveness and Somewhat different, but it may give you a little bit more information on, on those. Thank outcomes. you. Thank you so much. And thank you for these, this information. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you. I do have one other question. Uh, this is Grace Lee. It, it, it's around this question that people keep asking, which is Is it a difference in the variance in terms of the clinical presentation of kids, um, or is it? Uh, related to background rates of vaccination that is protecting a large proportion of kids. And, and I ask this specifically for MISC, uh, the, the difference that you see um, with the number of cases in the Omicron wave 
and the number of reported cases of MISC uh, seems somewhat different than in prior waves. Um, but on the other hand, I'm just wondering if now with the five to 11 year old age group and the 12 and older having higher rates of vaccination in the background, if that would be expected or if you think this truly is related to Omicron versus Delta versus the other variants. Um, may I have slide 30 again? And I'm actually going to defer that question to Dr. Zimbrano, our MIS um, expert. Hey, um, sure. Thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine. So um, this definitely is an interesting trend, and it is starting to bear out in multiple data sources that we have seen. Um, and so we are seeing reduced incidence of MISC after Omicron. We can't really at this point tease out whether or not this is potentially attributed to the actual variant, or if this is some conglomeration of, say, immune tolerance built up through either multiple infections or through immunization. Um, but it is a real trend that we are observing. Thank you. It'd be great if there were ways to untangle this. I'm not sure if the data sources we have available in public health surveillance would provide that, but I, I do think it keeps coming up. <laughs> oh, I absolutely agree. And we are working to disentangle that very question right now. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Yep. Finley. Okay, I've got two questions. First of all, when we're talking, one of the things that's been humbling about COVID-19 is it's forever changing. And we've been talking about Omicron. And I wanted to give you an opportunity to talk about is Omicron one thing or has that been evolving too? First. I'll stop there and let you answer that question. Then I've got a second question. Um, absolutely. Um, Omicron is, um, as we all know, um, it, it's a variant of SARS-CoV-2, but there are sublineages within that. And I, I wonder if um, we have either um, Dr. Thornburg or Dr. Scobie on the line who might want to talk a little bit more about Omicron variant. Uh, yeah, this is Natalie Thornburg. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so uh, my my audio is a little off. Could you go ahead and um, repeat the question, please? Yes. All right. So one of the things that we have um, recognized is that COVID-19 is forever humbling. And we've been talking about the Omicron epidemic, but is that constant or how much has that been changing? Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the Omicron variants, um, there are, you know, a lot of different sub-variants. And really, this, the first wave that occurred in December, January has been um, really the most dramatic wave of Omicron. Um, there have been several different sub-variants that have, that have sort of changed in prevalence since December. It started with a BA, something called BA.1. Um, then BA.2 during the very sort of low time in March and April, and now we're seeing um, some sub-variants of BA.2 and BA.4 and 5 um, uh, increase. Um, they're all, though, Omicrons um, that have been circulating, and they do seem to differ a little bit from each other in um, escape from immunity, but it's, it's subtle differences. They're all Omicrons. Um, and but they do not seem to differ um, in regards to severity dramatically from from one another. Um, so so it's still really an omicron omicron wave that we're seeing, but but there are subtle differences in the subvariants as they sort of increase and decrease in prevalence. Okay, thank you. That's very helpful. Um, my second question is related to the slide that's on here, and I very much appreciate Dr. Lair's math. And what I understood was if you take into account asymptomatic disease, about 1 in 3,000 to 1 in 4,000 children will get MISC. And if I understand correctly, that 60 to 70% of children with MISC will be admitted to the 
ICU, that means your risk of ICU hospitalization is somewhere around 1 in 5,000 to 1 in 7,000. Um, and I just wanted to see if that map is making sense to others. Thank you. Um, I'll let Dr. Zambrano weigh in specifically about MISC, but I do want to I, I do want to just frame that that is um, that that is not the only reason that children with COVID-19 are admitted to the ICU. That as we saw earlier with the COVID net data from COVID-19 associated hospitalizations, um, about just less than a quarter of children in this age group with um, COVID-19 associated hospitalization are admitted to the ICU. So that um, that math does not take into account uh, hospitalization for acute COVID infection. And Dr. Zimbrano, do oh, you I'm sorry. Thank you. Add any more to that? That's very yeah. I, um, this is Laura Zimbrano. Um, just just to add, I completely agree um, with you, Catherine. Um, so. Uh, that, that Dr. Feeling, that math does add up. I mean, in terms of the overall risk per se of um, of ICU admission attributed to MISC, um, it would probably be in the realm of about say one to one in five thousand, one in seven thousand infections, including asymptomatic or subclinical infections. But um, ICU admission attributable to severe COVID is is another question entirely, um, and, and it's and it is more um, common. But it is true that about about uh, between 60 and 70 percent of children with MISC would be expected to be admitted to the ICU. So it is a very severe clinical uh, complication. Thank you. Um, I apologize. I have two more questions. <laughs> Today I have a bunch of questions for you. Um, well, one is a comment in that I think that Similar to or akin to MISC, you know, I, we we talk about you know COVID being less severe, less severe in kids. Omicron is less severe, but you know, I I'm starting to wonder whether or not um, it really is that we have now a greater proportion of the population vaccinated. Um, some individuals have also had infection, so you know, thinking about severity by variant versus severity by the fact that we are this far into the pandemic and now with a pretty um, uh, robust and available vaccination program. You know, I wonder if we're um, not articulating as well the importance of vaccination because we're saying things seem less severe nowadays than before. Um, and I think it's really important for the public to know that the counterfactual uh, might not be true. We could be in the same situation today as we were in the very beginning of the pandemic if we didn't have vaccines available. So just, you know, again, an ask to continue to do our best to look at that data to understand if it really is variant specific, how much is it due to the variant versus how much is it due to where we are in this uh, vaccination program and in the pandemic uh, two years in, because it does feel like um, the messaging, uh, you know, comes across differently in the more recent waves. Um, the other, you know, piece uh, related to that and the younger kids is, you know, a lot of younger kids were protected for the longest period of time because we had so many other mitigation measures in place. Um, so it wouldn't be unanticipated that this population of kids who didn't have access to vaccine and who perhaps were protected fairly well until recently um, would suddenly have a surge of hospitalizations um, and uh, severe illness. Um, also, these younger kids, I, I suppose it doesn't surprise me because uh, we know that younger kids have smaller airways and they have a little bit less reserve, that they would come in, healthy kids otherwise uh, would have come in with severe disease. Um, so again, highlighting the importance of prevention in this um, arena. And then the final thing, you know, I, I was thinking and reflecting on the question and that I think it was Dr. Paling that asked about disparities by race, ethnicity um, with regard to hospitalization. Um, I, I certainly think that there are disparities that exist, um, but I also wonder about disparities in um, testing and disparities in circulating rates of infection. And so, you know, how much of that information can continue to help us by um, highlighting the importance of testing, the importance of having tests available, um, and, uh, you know, really appreciate the government's efforts to continue to make that available to the public. Uh, without access to testing, um, it's going to be really hard to interpret this information um, in a robust way. So, you know, is it, are they, are individuals where we see the disparities at higher risk for severe disease? Or is it that the background rates of infection are just so high um, that we are seeing more of them uh, coming in proportionately, uh, uh, becoming hospitalized or with severe illness? I think both could be true, but just um, it's hard to disentangle this data from what we're able to see today. Uh, so just an ask if it's possible to continue to look at that data more critically. Thank you for all of that. 
Uh, Dr. Sanchez. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And really, um, it's a great presentation, and uh, appreciate it. My, I was just impressed with the seroprevalence data. Um, what I remember is that six months to four years of age, there was a 71% ser positive um, seroprevalence. And I mean, that to me was pretty amazing. And um, first of all, I liked a little bit of information about the, you know, the, the, the study, the um, United States, how that reflects the general population of children um, to see how inclusive it is. Because if that really is the general seroprevalence data that we're seeing in this age group, uh, our message will also be have to change. And I know we'll hear more about the recommendations and what we think, but um, you know the his the you know this natural immunity and um, and the fact that you know that a lot of these children um, will be getting vaccinated despite the fact that they've had it before, which we know we rec we are recommending in the older uh, children and adolescents. So I'd like a little bit more information on that seroprevalence data because it really was kind of amazing, seventy one percent. Yes, and can we have slide 10, please? And, and while you're pulling that up, I believe either Dr. Jones or Dr. Clark may be on who can speak more to the methods of that study. Hi, yeah, this is uh, Dr. Christy Clark. Um, so thanks so much for this question. Yeah, it, it really is important information. And in, in the, the population of children, um, six months to four years, you can see that since December 20. 21, um, the uh, seroprevalence or the proportion of that population that has um, antibodies um, induced by a, a prior infection with SARS-CoV-2 has uh, more than doubled, gone from 33% to 71%. Now, regarding methods for this study, um, all of the uh, samples, all of the estimates are adjusted uh, for the ages of children. Um, for the uh, sex of children and for rural or urban uh, status of their uh, county of residence um, to, in order to make the results as representative as possible. Now it is calculated from samples that were submitted for uh, clinical testing at commercial lab. So we did some analyses um, that are available in the preprint that you see referenced on this slide um, to, uh, to look at some potential sources of bias of looking at commercial lab specimens in this age group. Um, uh, just uh, given that, you know, some children may require more frequent um, care, healthcare monitoring than other children. And what we uh, found in that study was we, we compared uh, children who had ICD-10 codes or uh, were getting lab tests that may have been more likely to indicate that they're getting a uh, well child care um, or, or more routine care um, and compared that to other pediatric samples. And we actually found uh, that the seroprevalence among those groups of children are, are, fairly, um, are fairly close and actually just a very slightly higher seroprevalence among those kids uh, who, were, uh, who were seeking uh, uh, things that were more likely to reflect well child care or, or more routine monitoring care. Um, and so we don't believe that um, uh, that uh, children uh, who are seeking more frequent healthcare monitoring due to special health conditions are, are a significant source of bias for these samples. And, and as I said, they are, they are weighted for several demographic uh, factors. So I hope that that's helpful in your consideration of these data. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McNally. Um, do you mind if I just add a little bit to that? Um, of course. So I, I just wanted to let you all know that we will, um, or Dr. Oliver tomorrow will be um, talking a little bit more about how this will fit into the context of the vaccine um, recommendations. Um, so stay tuned for that tomorrow. And I think Dr. Jones might also be on the call. I don't know if you wanted to add anything else. Sure, I mean, just a quick blurb about the benefits of, of the evidence of vaccination after infection. So infection induced protection against infection appears very poor against Omicron infection. And, and it wanes over time, although not as quickly as vaccine induced protection. And although infection-induced protection against severe disease appears to be more robust, evidence has consistently shown that vaccination in those previously infected uh, substantially boosts protection against both infection 
and against severe disease. And some of that data will, will be presented later. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Ms. McNally? Thank you. Dr. Fleming Dutra, I'm not sure if this question is more appropriate for you or for the next speaker, but I'm wondering about the impact of vaccination in this age group on community immunity or herd immunity. Thank you. Um, thanks for that question. I think it's really important. I, I probably will um, defer um, that question um, to following the, the next presentation regarding vaccine effectiveness. Thank you. Um, Dr. Brooks. Yes. First of all, I think this is a really important presentation and the one in front of it uh, framing the issue. I think it's very, uh, we need to understand the need to get these children vaccinated. Um, my question and comment is related to the disruption based on um, of, of job, uh, uh, job conti continuation. Um, can you speculate on why you think the higher rates among African Americans and the Latinx are there? Is it higher rates of exposure of COVID-19 of their children? Is it the particular employment? Uh, is it the inability to work from home? I'm just curious about that particular data because I think that's overlooked the effect beyond illness, but on uh, everyday life of the families. Um, thank you for that. And I can, can I have slide 38? Um, I have to, um, this, these data are from the Kaiser Family Foundation, and it's an excellent question as to to why certain um, groups of parents are, are more impacted um, by job disruption, um, either leaving a job or changing work schedules to take care of their children. Um, I the the particular source did not um, did not go into detail about you know why certain parents were more likely to be impacted. Um, by job disruptions due to child care. And so, um, well, I think it's a very interesting question. I'm afraid that I would, I would have to speculate um, and I, I, I don't want to, don't want to do that without data to back it up, but it's a, it's a very important question. Thank you. Thank you. I think at this time we will move on to the next presentation. Dr. Ruth Lingellis to review updates on vaccine effectiveness in children and adolescents and look forward to coming back to Ms. McNally's question after the presentation. Great, thank you so much. Um, today I'll be sharing updates on COVID-19 vaccine effectiveness during Omicron for children and adolescents. Next slide. I'll start first with CDC's PROTECT platform. This is a prospective cohort study in children aged four months to 17 years that includes weekly swabbing regardless of symptom status, so should not be impacted by changes in testing practices due to the availability of home tests. The study uses a Cox proportional hazards model with adjustment for propensity to be vaccinated, site, SARS-CoV-2 circulation, and community mask use. Results were separated by age group, 5 to 11 years, and 12 to 17 years. Next slide. Dr. Lentgelis, would you be able to step a little closer to the microphone? Sure. Is this better? Yes. Thank you. These, re these results are updated from the Folks et al. MMWR published in March and extend those findings through April 23rd. Here we have VE against infection for 5 to 11-year-olds on the top and 12 to 17-year-olds on the bottom, further separated by time since last dose. Note that for the 5 to 11-year-old group, there was not enough power in the 60-plus days after the second dose, and so the confidence interval was too wide to make meaningful conclusions, so we have not included that estimate. Comparing the early post-second dose period, note that although the point estimates are different for the two age groups, the confidence intervals for the adolescent group overlap entirely with the confidence intervals for the kids, though the time intervals are a bit different. In the adolescent group, a booster dose provides a significant increase in VE, bringing VE up to 83%, a median of 95 days or more than three months after the booster. Next slide. Moving on now to the Increasing Community Access to Testing, or ICAT platform, which is a national community-based drive-through testing platform with data from pharmacies. This platform relies on self-reported vaccine history and uses a test-negative design where cases are persons with at least one COVID-like symptom and positive NAT test, and controls are symptomatic with a negative NAT test. Models are adjusted for the variables shown here. We present data on adults first to show the differences between Delta and Omicron. Adults were tested from December 10th through January 1st with Omicron determined by S-gene target failure. 
Tests in kids were included between December 26th and February 21st, when almost all circulating disease in the country was Omicron. These results have been previously shared with ACIP, but we've included them here for completeness. Next slide. This is previously published adult data for Delta in orange and Omicron in blue by time since the second dose shown on the x-axis with VE on the y-axis and the dotted lines showing the 95% confidence intervals. You can see the lower starting VE for Omicron and much quicker waning compared to Delta, including zero in the confidence interval by three months after the second dose. Next slide. Now we show the same adult Delta and Omicron data and overlay data from adolescents 12 to 15 years of age in black and children 5 to 11 years of age in pink. Note the shorter follow-up time for the 5 to 11 year olds due to vaccine being recommended for them in November. Generally, we see very similar patterns across the age groups with two doses of mRNA vaccines providing roughly 60% protection initially and quickly waning by a few months after the second dose, reaching zero by three to five months after the second dose. Next slide. These are updated data from what I've previously shared with ACIP. We're concentrating here on just the 12 to 15 year old group. And in black, we have the same two dose VE as shown on the previous slide. We've now overlaid the three versus two dose relative VE for the same age group in blue. We continue to see waning against symptomatic infection even after the third dose, though not quite as extreme as after the second dose. Next slide. Moving on now from VE against infection to VE for emergency department and urgent care visits and hospitalization, the Vision Network is a multi-state network based on electronic healthcare records. Like ICAT, it uses a test negative design with cases having CLI and a positive PCR and controls having CLI with a negative PCR. VE is adjusted for propensity to be vaccinated weights, calendar time, region, local virus circulation, and age, and vaccination is determined via health records and state and city registries. Next slide. This is an update to data included in the Klein et al. MMWR in March, showing VE against emergency department and urgent care for children 5 to 11 on the top and adolescents 12 to 15 on the bottom. For the 14 to 59 days after the second dose, we see almost identical VE point estimates in the two groups, 50 to 56 percent, with wider confidence intervals for the adolescents since it's been much longer since they were recommended to be vaccinated. The adjusted VE drops substantially for adolescents 60 days after vaccination. On the bottom of the slide, I've noted the case definition for an EDUC visit, which highlights here the potential for inclusion of children visiting urgent cares and EDs with COVID instead of for COVID, likely a bigger concern for kids than for adults as the case definition includes GI symptoms, which may have many, non -frequent, many frequent non-COVID causes in kids and could potentially drive the VE estimates for ED and UC closer to those of infection in kids. As with the infection estimates, a booster dose provided a significant increase in VE among 12 to 15 year olds, 73%, up to, up to a median of 58 days after the booster. Next slide. Here we have VE of two doses against hospitalization for children five to 11 and adolescents 12 to 18 years of age during Delta and Omicron. This slide has been previously shared with ACIP and published via MMWR. Updated data were not available due to the relatively few children hospitalized once the initial Omicron wave subsided. For the five to 11 group, year old group, you can see that there were only two hospitalizations, two hospitalization breakthroughs during the study period, which included two months after children in that age group could be fully vaccinated. While the point estimate for 5 to 11 year olds, 74%, is lower than the point estimate for 12 to 15 year olds, 92%, that's likely because the younger age group included 67% Omicron cases, for which VE is lower compared to earlier variants, while the older age group included only 15% Omicron cases. Next slide. Finally, I'll show results from the Overcoming COVID platform. Overcoming COVID is a test negative VE platform specifically aimed at children and adolescents hospitalized at 31 pediatric medical centers in 23 US states. As with other platforms, cases have CLI and a positive test while controls have CLI and a negative test. Vaccination status is determined using a combination of documentation in the medical record and self-report and modeled via logistic regression. Next slide. This is an update to a recent publication in New England Journal of Medicine. 
We see VE for 5 to 11-year-olds of 68% to a median of 37 days after the second dose, and VE for 12 to 18-year-olds of 51%. In the older kids, we can see VE split by time since vaccination, with some indication of waning at 23 to 45 weeks. Unfortunately, uptake of booster doses in adolescents was not high enough to assess additional protection against hospitalization afforded by the booster dose. Next slide. Here we have updated data on VE against MISC for both age groups with a VE of 78% for kids and 90% for adolescents. Again, I would note that similar to the estimates shown for vision and hospitalization, the 12 to 18 year old estimates likely comprise many more Delta cases compared to the younger age group, which likely accounts for the higher VE for, for the older kids. We do not see a signal here for waning in the adolescent group, and similar to hospitalization, we did not have enough power to assess additional protection due to a booster. Next slide. In summary, uh, VE against infection, uh, for two-dose do two VE declined quickly for children and adolescents during Omicron and followed a similar pattern to that of adults. A booster dose in adolescents substantially improved VE compared to two doses, though some waning appears evident. A similar pattern was noted for emergency department and urgent care visits with VE similar after two doses in both age groups with evidence of waning and substantial additional protection from a third dose among adolescents. Finally, for severe disease, two doses provided protection for both children and, adult, and adolescents, with some waning evident for hospitalization in adolescents. There was not enough power to assess waning in children or the impact of boosters against hospitalization or MISC in, in adolescents. Next slide. I'd like to acknowledge the individual shown here, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lynn Gillis, and this presentation is now open for questions. Ms. McNally. Thank you. I am wondering about the impact of vaccination in this age group on community immunity or herd immunity. Thank you. Sure. Um, I think that's a pretty complicated question given the presence of new variants. Uh, we know that protection from both prior infection and from vaccination is not 100%, um, and even children and adults with evidence of past infection and past vaccination can get reinfected. Um, so I think at this point, it's a little bit of a misnomer to talk about herd immunity as something that will, you know, substantially reduce Omicron circulation. Um, vaccine does have a substantial impact on infection initially. We do see that wane. Um, but that, that vaccination protection is maintained against severe disease. Um, and we know that individuals that are, uh, have a prior infection and then do go on to get vaccinated, do see a substantial increase in protection, um, which gives them broader protection against uh, a wider array of variants, including the original, as well as whatever circulating variant they uh, were infected with. Dr. Paling. All right. I want to say thank you for this great presentation and summarizing so many different studies. And I wanted to verify that my interpretation um, is correct. So as I am looking at the data for both age groups 5 to 11 and 12 to 17, if the primary outcome is um, the presence of any um, case of infection, that wanes pretty quickly. But when you start to look at ED visits, it wanes but is higher and stays significant. And then when you get to hospitalizations, that, that maintains um, minor, uh, much smaller amounts of waning. And then importantly, that the vaccine prevents, um, is protective against MISC. Is that a correct interpretation? Thank you. Yes, I think that's absolutely correct. And it's important, I think, to emphasize here that the patterns that we see in children and adolescents are essentially identical to the patterns that we see in adults. So during Delta, for example, we had higher infection, higher uh, vaccination of vaccine effectiveness against infection, um, but that that has decreased during Omicron. Um, but during the Omicron period where we do see, as you mentioned, uh, quicker waning against infection, we see higher 
vaccine effectiveness for EDUC and even higher for hospitalization and the highest for MISC. Um, and that's the same pattern that we see in adults where the most severe, most critical outcomes have the highest uh, vaccine protection. Thank you, Dr. Daly. Yeah, thanks so much. Could you go back to your summary slide? Um, So yeah, so I think what we've heard from parents, especially parents who have some, you know, con concerns, they they want um, a full conversation of what's known and what's not known. So I I wonder if you could just highlight for us um, again. I think I caught this, but kind of where the gaps are. Um, you highlighted this, but kind of where where the gaps are and and when we might expect data about those about those gaps, um, gaps in knowledge about prevention of. Um, uh, hospitalization severe disease in particular. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's an important point. Um, so one gap I think that we've identified is uh, especially for the more severe endpoints uh, waning in the 5 to 11-year-old group. And that's uh, primarily just because of the timing of when they were vaccinated. And so um, many children were not yet fully vaccinated during the height of the Omicron wave in uh, January. And so by the time those children became fully vaccinated and were eligible for inclusion in these studies, the uh, BA1 wave of Omicron had, had mostly subsided. And so we just didn't accrue enough cases uh, within our platforms to look at that. Um, unfortunately, with the current surge that we're seeing and BA4 and 5 picking up, um, I would expect that we would have additional power to look at, at waning in the 5 to 11-year-olds over the summer, um, and we plan to continue to look at that, um, and we'll circulate back to ACIP if we have that. The other missing piece, I think, um, also related to coverage uh, is the booster dose for 12 to 15-year-olds, um, and that was also just due to the timing they were recommended to, to be boosted in January. Um, and so we didn't accrue a lot of cases um, in that age group during the Omicron wave. I will also emphasize that in both of these age groups, um, low coverage has often prevented us from um, assessing uh, vaccine effectiveness. Um, and then we also don't have estimates yet for boosters in 5 to 11, and that's, of course, because they were only uh, recently recommended for that. So all three of those gaps, I think, will continue to assess over the summer um, and, and circle back to ACIP when we have meaningful estimates. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Lee, can I then ask a follow-up question? Of course, Dr. Dale. Um, then can you just then remind us about vaccination with a booster as a means of preventing severe illness in adults, because in some ways that it doesn't entirely fill in that gap, but I but I interpret that gap in the context of what we've learned about prevention of severe illness in adults. Over. Yeah, absolutely. And so we know from the infection data, where we do have a lot more data on kids, that kids are following an almost identical pattern to adults. So I think it's a fair assumption that we would see similar patterns against severe disease in children as in adults. Um, and in adults, we know that two doses during Omicron does give some protection but wanes more quickly. A third dose largely restores protection um, that the two doses initially afforded, and then we see much, sl much slower waning of the third dose compared to two doses. Um, so for those 5 to 11-year-olds and 12 to 15-year-olds that have not gotten vaccinated, a primary series is going to provide um, a, a great initial uh, protection against Omicron, but a booster dose will give them longer lasting protection. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Well, we need to see if other hands are raised. I, I, um, I have a question slash comment, sorry, and I'm trying to think about how to ask this. Um, one of the challenges that we've had with vaccine effectiveness studies is um, the limited variability in terms of dosing intervals uh, for vaccines. And, you know, part of me, we've only actually had Pfizer vaccines to date for kids um, that are younger. So I, I wonder about this two versus three dose question. Um, it does seem like the data you showed um, gives us some evidence that three doses um, might be preferable, um, and whether or not it's a booster or a part of a primary series, I guess, is a question and perhaps just an, um, a semantics question. Um, but I, but I do think that you know, 
I feel still challenged by the fact that maybe three doses should should have been the the baseline uh, to begin with. And um, the other question that's a sub question of that is whether or not longer intervals between dose one and dose two, and then the same question holds between dose two and dose three, would um, give us a greater sense or greater effectiveness overall um, and perhaps longer durability of immunity. Um, so just wondering if that is something that you can continue to look at, recognizing we have very limited variability in dosing intervals. Um, but that information to me still seems important about whether or not additional doses are needed, additional booster doses are needed. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Lee. I think that's an important question. Um, it's something that we have looked at uh, repeatedly in a number of our platforms in the United States, and I'm aware of international data showing higher effectiveness uh, with further spacing of the vaccines. But in the U.S., um, individuals followed pretty closely the three-week uh, interval for Pfizer and four-week interval for Moderna, and so we ha just haven't had enough variability in our own data to look at it. Yeah, so maybe it's a question back to Pfizer and Moderna to ask about uh, whether or not those dosing interval studies could be done to give us a better sense of how to make this immunity more durable. Um, Dr. Long. Um, yes, thank you. This is somewhat related. Um, can you find the slide that you show us the um, the, the uh, trajectory of waning for three doses versus two doses in older? Um, and um, it, it, I, I jotted down for my own, although you mentioned that waning is slower following the third, I had jotted down that it looks like the same trajectory. It's just that you're starting higher. So would you comment on that? I mean, you don't have very, I don't know how many people you have here, four months to know, does it really level off there or does it continue? How confident are you? It's just a question of, of the rapidity, the trajectory of fall. Is it really going to be better following the third dose, that it's more sustained, or are you just starting at a higher level? And for me, this also pertains a little bit to think about if 70% of the children that we would administer a vaccine to have had their first infection, does that first dose act a little bit more like a second dose and the second dose act like a third dose? So I'm wondering in the data that we have, and we'll see from the manufacturer about how many they knew were or weren't seronegative at the beginning. But anyhow, so how do you interpret this trajectory of fall? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I mean, I think, so I think you're right. I think there's slightly higher starting VE uh, and then slower waning potentially with, um, you know, it's sort of bottoming out a little bit higher than it did for two doses. It doesn't quite get down to zero. Um, so there's the potential there that we would see a little bit more lasting protection of some degree um, in third dose vaccines. But I think we just need a couple of more uh, months of data accrual there. And then of course at five months, um, uh, sorry. Yeah. So I, I think we we do, we just need a couple of more months of, of data accrual. Um, as far as prior infection for this particular analysis, we did exclude individuals who reported a prior infection. So these should be, uh, you know, individuals with no history of prior infection receiving a true two dose or three dose series. Um, I believe that there will be more information shared um, specifically about protection from prior infection um, during the meeting tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Lair? Thank you. Um, I would like to second Dr. Lee's comments on the three-dose series and the possible increasing spacing between the vaccines. Um, this is more a comment. I don't really expect an answer, and it might be a comment for the FDA, but I'm not sure how we're ever going to get the data or the information that's going to tell us that this is really a three-dose series or that we should be facing the first two doses by two months. I want to thank the manufacturers for getting the vaccines out as quickly as possible. And they found out that this pattern worked and it was wonderful to have these vaccines, but we don't know if what we have right now is the best way of giving the vaccines. And I'm not sure how the FDA or the ACIP is going to figure out 
the best way or if there is a best way. But Dr. Plotkin brought this up many, many months ago, probably over a year ago, that this really might be a three-dose vaccine all along. And we just started off with two doses because that worked and that allowed us to vaccinate the population. So I'm curious, interested, if anyone has any ideas on how we are going to get that information to find the best way of vaccinating our population. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think in the U.S., it's unlikely that we'll have real world data um, just because people have been following the recommendations pretty closely. So I think we would have to rely on international data. Hi, this is uh, Jordan Fink from FDA. I'll, I'll just jump in that, um, yes, I, I agree that it, we're unlikely to get relevant data from the U.S. Um, and so we will have to look at, at international uh, re real world data, but um, you know this this is something that could be studied uh, by the vaccine manufacturer, uh, looking at at different different dosing intervals. Um, and, and you asked, uh, I think you asked a couple of, of different questions. One one related to the optimal dosing interval, and then one related to is this a two dose regimen or a, a three dose regimen? And uh, you know we've had to adjust and, and build on to our um, our uh, authorizations and our labeling as, as we go along. And I, I hope that that one of the things we have an opportunity to do over the summer um, as we're preparing for a fall vaccination campaign and, and potentially a change in, in vaccine strain composition, although that, that remains to be determined, I, I hope that we have some time to take a step back and, and really think about uh, what makes the most sense in terms of regimen um, and try to simplify things a little bit for, for uh, patients and, and healthcare providers. Over. Thank you, Dr. Fink. That was really helpful. Yes, I mean, I think um, you're right. This question is um, answerable, and we still have opportunity because we still have a lot of children who are not yet vaccinated and who will likely receive, um, you know, more than... <laughs> one dose or two doses or three doses of uh, COVID vaccines over their lifetime. So I think this is uh, really helpful and a, still an opportunity for us to study this. Um, and so look forward to our manufacturers presenting and to hear their thoughts about this. Um, Dr. Paling, and then we'll go to break. Okay. Um, Dr. Lee Gellis, one of the things that we've been thinking a lot about is children uh, are people of, across all ages that are immunocompromised. Fortunately, that's not a huge population in children, but do you have any insights about VE among children um, who are immunocompromised? Thank you. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, generally, we just have not had power to, to separate by immunocompromised status um, in, in any of our platforms to look at VE. I mean, I would refer back to uh, Dr. Fleming Dutro's presentation and note that, you know, over half of uh, these hospitalized kids are not, do not have underlying conditions. Um, and, and that's generally been true, you know, even amongst the vaccinated, what we see is that um, hospitalized kids tend to have more underlying conditions of the general population, but certainly not all. Um, and then for immunocompromised in particular, I would say that, um, you know, just like with general VE, I think we would expect it to follow a similar pattern to adults where we do see lower vaccine effectiveness amongst immunocompromised adults. And that's why there's the additional primary series um, dose and now an additional booster dose recommended for them. Um, and so I would refer to tomorrow where I think we'll talk about the dosing regimens and additional doses for immunocompromised. Thank you. And with that, we will um, break. Uh, th I wanna thank our speakers again and, and thank you for the robust discussion today. Uh, we will break um, until the top of the hour, so 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, uh, 9 a.m. Pacific Time. Thanks, everyone.